What's up, guys? Bentley, Mr. Bentley, back again uh, with video number two in our first unit. Uh, just a quick introduction to uh, some of the tools that we'll be using, um, and really, really important uh, some concepts on um, data, data assessment and analysis. Because remember, one of my major goals for us this year is for us to become absolutely awesome at data assessment. Um, you know, making inferences, conclusions, justifying them, etc. Uh, so with that, let's take a quick look and let's get started. So as we just said, I kind of blew it with the introduction here, but um, we're going to have a lot on our plate this year because you are amateur budding biologists. So there are a lot of skills and, and things that you need to do to meet with success this year and in life and in the study of life as a biologist. Uh, as we said, uh, something that you, I'm sure, have done before, but to create graphs. I know you've been making graphs forever, what may feel like forever, but uh, also interpreting graphs. Um, a lot of students I've noticed over the years are very skilled in the art of, of creating graphs, but then yet struggle with the interpretation of them uh, and drawing conclusions, justifying relationships. These are huge skills that you'll need to master and we'll take a look at some of those uh, today. Uh, massing some of the basic lab skills, massing objects, measuring amounts of liquids, measuring temperatures, uh, all that good stuff. Uh, a lot of the things that you've done before and we'll quickly look at some of those. And again, in our activities in the classroom itself, um, in many learning centers, we'll be practicing uh, many of these skills. In fact, you've already begun do doing some of them. So uh, with that in mind, as I said here, uh, let's begin by starting with that first uh, checklist. Uh, let's take a look at a basic graph. Uh, and if we look at this here, uh, without too much to do, I'm going to uh, allow you to pl ask you to do one thing here and I'll, I'll shut up. Uh, please pause the video in just a moment and I want you to look at this graph and see if you can summarize uh, and explain trends. What is it showing? What's happening? Uh, and then make some inferences. Maybe why might it be happening? So uh, go ahead and push pause and take a look at this and uh, uh, feel free to jot down some ideas and unpause me in just a moment. We'll continue on. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, this graph again and some of the conclusions and things that, uh, ideas that maybe we could uh, perhaps come up with. So uh, if we begin, obviously one of the best places to start within a graph is our title. All graphs need to have a clear descriptive title. Uh, and notice that this one is, is very, very descriptive in that it's telling you what it's about, um, the factors involved, nice straight line there, Bentley. Um, uh, one of the problems I've noticed with students in the past is they would want to call this just uh, George W. Bush or George's job. Um, and you need to really supply the viewer, the reader, with clear-cut titles. So you really want to make sure that you take care of that. Uh, obviously, as we can see, this is in the line graph format. Um, so obviously, compared to some of the other graphs, a pie chart, a bar graph, which we'll look at in a second. Uh, another thing that this does, uh, which is very, very important, is it does give a, a clear labeled key. Uh, as we can see here, we've got one, two, three, four lines, and that'd be pretty tough. They are color-coded, uh, excuse me, different colors so we can differentiate amongst them to see the trends, but without a key these lines could be useless. Uh, and perhaps one of the most important would be uh, labeling of our axis. Right here we've labeled the x-axis, over on the end there we've labeled the y-axis. So uh, very important that we do that as well. Um, always want to have that. So those are kind of our general rules for making a graph. But now as far as interpreting this graph, what, what is, what's happening? What is it showing? Uh, and if we look at our trends that over time here on the x-axis, uh, as time goes by, the percentages over on the y-axis uh, of approval rate or, or, and disapproval, essentially the approval rate here, the darker colored greens, the trend is they appear to be going down. And the disapprove and strongly disapprove, uh, the lighter colorations, especially the strongly disapprove, appear to be generally over time, as time goes by, uh, they are increasing. 
and going up. So uh, we would have to be able to draw a summary here, um, make a summary sentence. And another key thing that we'll look at would be maybe some inferences. When we say we infer, uh, what would happen outside beyond this graph if we were to continue on beyond January 07? What, do you, what inferences can you make? What might happen? Uh, some other conclusions. Uh, we'd want to be able to draw another very important skill. Uh, why? Why did this? Why did these trends occur? Um, why is the approval rate? Why did it go down? Why did that uh, disapproval rate go up? Um, and if you look at it, well, we really start to see some of the major changes here um, in this area is right around where we became mired in some uh, war action. Um, some of you <laughs> kind of young to remember. Uh, but there are always are reasons. And, and these two skills here, making inferences, uh, being able to extrapolate, which is a fancy nerd term, a nerd way for saying going beyond the data, which we mean again outside the data what happens. What do you think the data points might look like uh, are all key skills that we'd want to make sure that we master there. So that's very, very important. Um, shifting gears, looking at another quick standard uh, type of graph here. This is a uh, a bar graph as you can see um, and I'm gonna ask you to do the same thing again here to go ahead and pause the video uh, and if you could summarize the data what it's showing and another thing I'd like you to do is to try to point out and, and pick up on a, a couple of things that you might do differently that maybe make this not necessarily a very good graph so go ahead and pause it and unpause me in just a minute Okay, well, hopefully you've picked up on uh, several things here uh, for us to do. Notice that, obviously, uh, this is showing a little more biology-rated uh, type graph, that we do have our labeled x-axis. We do have our labeled y-axis over here. Um, and so that's set up nicely. You can see clearly defined increments. And this graph appears to be dealing with, right here, we have a rhinoceros beetle. Um, and looks like he's flying. You can see the two sets of wings here. Um, and what it appears to be measuring is vibrations per second in of the wings of four different uh, insects, members of the arthropoda kingdom. Um, and again, we should be able to do the same things. We should be able to, a uh, uh, graph is a picture that's screaming data to us and, and helping us make connections. Uh, some summaries that we clearly could make. Well, clearly the mosquito over here has the highest by far of the vibrations per second. Beetle over here being the lowest um, and in between. So usually we, we can see that a bar graph is usually great to display and to count data. Um, as far as anything wrong with this graph, hopefully you were able to pick up on something we said last image. This graph's lacking a title. Where the heck is the title on this graph? Ooh, that's a big no-no. Graphs should always be clearly labeled with a clear title uh, as well. Uh, so that's a big one. But again, we should be able to make some trends. We should be able to predict. We should be able to make inferences uh, and extrapolate. Um, also read into uh, inferences in terms of where do you think if we said a, uh, a deer fly where do you think, if you had to guess, where the data would fall in there? A deer fly is very, very similar, very closely related to a house fly, about the same size, uh, very similar lifestyle, so uh, much larger than a mosquito. Um, notice in, uh, that that would allow us to, to make some guesses as well. So graphing, graphing takes some... Uh, practice to getting used to as far as analyzing. Uh, I know that most of you can make graphs, but if we follow the general rules, but the analysis of it is is very key. So a couple of things. With line graphs, we almost always want to do them when we show uh, some type of variable changing over time or changing in relationship to another factor, such as temperature. Uh, how does uh, how do temperatures change throughout the year? How does growth rate in plants change, etc.? Uh, so usually when you're showing change over time, and one very important rule, uh, the independent variable as we have right here is always on the x-axis. So in other words, whatever variable you're changing, like for example in our first graph, uh, George W. Bush, uh, if we go back and look at that. 
the uh, independent variable was time. As time went by with our uh, insect wing beating vibration graph, what we were changing was the species of insect. So again, the independent variable always goes on the x-axis, dependent always on the y-axis. And dependent, <laughs> obviously as the name infers, always depends upon the independent variable. So as time goes by, we were counting and observing approval rates. Or with uh, the insects, as we changed the insect species, we were counting their number of wing vibrations. So what are you counting, measuring, and observing for dependent variable? Uh, cons conversely, we usually use a bar, bar graph when you want to count amounts or tally things, occurrences of something. Uh, really, really good at com uh, when you want to compare amounts of something. Uh, for example, like populations of organisms. Um, it would be a great example of that. But again, the whole independent dependent variable uh, applies there as well. Uh, really, really quickly, what about uh, tools? One of the tools you're going to be practicing with here, this is one you may not have seen before. This is a vernier probe, and it looks like some type of sensor microphone thing, and in essence it kind of is. This one is going to be a sensor. It's going to measure carbon dioxide, and we have this, and you're going to be using it uh, in our lab activity. Very easy, nice. It plugs into a computer. It does all the work for you. you got to click a button to start recording, click a button to stop really great uh, development in technology recently. Um, and along those lines, quickly some things that you may have used before. We are going to have to incorporate uh, some labs in which we um, I require you to mass out amounts of living organisms or to mass out uh, objects. So, so some quick important parts here that we can see. Uh, here is our calibration uh, line. This is to zero it out. We'll know we're zeroed when this line is flush with the uh, outside line. We can see here our sliding weights. Um, Obviously, we put our object here on the pan, as you probably already know, and slide the weights in this direction until it balances, and then all we do is add up our weights. Add the largest one, add the next one, add the final one. And don't forget, you do want to estimate one position. What we mean there is as you go to add them up, let's say we have an object that's 435 point two we can see on the scale we'd always want to estimate where that uh, pointer is going what would be that uh, hundredths place value and we also right down on the end cannot forget about the calibration knob you always want to start off calibrating this guy zeroing it in if you will before you begin using it uh, that one is a must as well uh, so speeding things up, wrapping them up, some things that you've used before, uh, obviously a graduated cylinder. Uh, don't forget to read the meniscus. You read the lowest point. That's for use in measuring liquids. We've done that before. And what about this bad Larry, the good old thermometer? Uh, we won't be using this guy. This is a... Uh, standard weather thermometer, but a dyed alcohol in there based on uh, differences uh, in air temperatures and densities will then actually force it up and you just read the amounts. Notice that we have Fahrenheit on this side, Celsius on this side. We'll be sticking mostly to Celsius there, but you know how those work. Uh, so in essence, um, what we're going to see, one of the most important tools will be a microscope, but more about that later. Ultimately, what we really want to worry about is, do you have, we want to polish our skills in anal collecting data with the tools and then being able to analyze and interpret and justify our conclusions. So with that in mind, thanks for watching. And now let's uh, play with and practice these skills a little bit in class at our learning centers. Have fun.